Well, once again, just a warm, warm welcome to you all. And those of you who are watching online, we're just so glad to uh, have you with us this morning. And uh, we started this new series last week called How Stuff Works. How Stuff Works. And and we're looking specifically uh, over the next few weeks at how one specific thing works that we call the church. The church. Now, if you're new to this church thing, or maybe you have background in the church and, and, and whatever it might be, sometimes if we're not careful, we can come up with all sorts of things for how we think the church ought to work, or what we think the church should be doing and what it shouldn't be doing, and, and oftentimes that comes down to opinion and what my personal preference is and all of that. Sometimes, you know, you kind of have to go back to the original And look at what the ingredients, what the things were that made that up. I would say about 30 years ago, 30 plus years ago, uh, I used to love to go and spend weekends with an aunt and uncle who had some cousins. I had some cousins, and uh, we all loved to be together. And on one particular weekend, I went to stay with them, and it happened to be their anniversary. Now, one thing you have to know uh, about my aunt, who has since gone home to be with Jesus, uh, she was an unbelievable cook. I think that's why I like to go stay with her. And and beyond cooking, she could bake like none other. And uh, so... My aunt and uncle went, went off for an anniversary dinner, and my cousins and I had this great idea that while they were gone, we were going to make them a cake. <laughs> so I went through her, her recipe book to find this cake that she was really known for making, found the recipe, got all the ingredients together, put the cake together, and realized that when I got down to one ingredient... I couldn't find it anywhere in the kitchen. So I grabbed the next best thing. (laughs) There was no vegetable oil anywhere. So I picked up a bottle that looked like vegetable oil, put it in, made the cake. The cake baked just fine. They came home and ate it. And my aunt said, what, what's in this cake? And I said, well, I couldn't find vegetable oil. So I used corn syrup. This was like diabetes in a pan, (laughs) all right? This cake was sweet, but they ate it and they were happy about it. But it wasn't quite like the original recipe because there was an ingredient missing. There's an ingredient that wasn't just right. And I think if if we're going to understand how stuff works, particularly the church, we've got to go back to the original, the first time we see the church come to be and say, what were the ingredients that made that thing work? And if we go into the Bible and we go to the New Testament, the second half of the Bible, we find a book there called the Book of Acts. It's actually short for the Acts of the Apostles. And it's all about the church getting started. Jesus has come. He's laid down his life. He's been raised from the dead. He's given his his apostles this mandate. You're going to go make disciples and get this thing done. You're going to do greater things than you even see me do. And and this thing gets started called the church. And this is what it it says to us in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, that's simply getting together, fellowship simply getting together, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many signs and wonders performed by the apostles. All the believers were together, had everything in common. They sold property, possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, I want you to see here, uh, I kind of color-coded this a little bit, because in in the yellow, we see what the church was doing. There was some teaching. There was a sense of community, getting together, breaking of bread. They were eating. They were praying. They were giving to those who had need. They were together. But if you notice something in the orange, all these words, they, everyone, all the believers, there, those are plural, aren't they? I've, I've heard people say, I don't need to, I don't need to go to church. Or be part of a church. And actually, if you go back to the original, that's, that's not possible. Because you and I were created for community. We were created for relationships. 
Right back to the very first signs of the ingredients of this thing called the church, we see that right there. So today what I want to talk to you about is two things. I want to talk to you about community, and I want to talk to you about serving. Because if you look, they gave to those who had need. They were together, and you're going to see later on uh, some, some of what they were about and what they did. What are these? Fences, right? We have uh, some taller fences, uh, that have, they're made of different things. This one's kind of a picket fence, maybe in, in, in front of somebody's house. But here's what I've learned about fences. Fences serve two purposes. Really, if you break it down to their, it's most simple. Fences serve two purposes. Now, they come in all shapes, sizes, styles, short, small, transparent, whatever it might be. But they all do this. They either keep something in or they keep something out. Pretty simple, right? Every fence is designed to do one of two things. It's going to keep something in or it's going to keep something out. There's a show or a a network on TV called HGTV. Any HGTV watchers in the house? All right, maybe you've, you've, you've watched Flip or Flop or whatever the, the show might be. But the whole, the whole idea of it is they renovate things and they fix things and they do landscape projects and, and everything like that. And here's what I've noticed when I watch that show, particularly when it comes to a house. Nine out of ten times, the front yard of the house looks great. It's the stuff in the backyard that needs fixing. It's the stuff that nobody really wants anybody to see. See, the fence is the separation between two spaces. It's the barrier between the front, which everyone's allowed to see, and the back, which is where we live. And and oftentimes we get so consumed with, well, I want to make sure that what people see looks good. It's presentable. It looks nice. I I, I can represent well. I really don't care what goes on in the backyard. And yet, I know, I know there's probably some ladies thinking today, man, I have been bugging him for years to do something with the backyard. And if that's you, I just simply want to say, you're welcome. All right? We have a mission here at, at TVC, and it's this. We're all about connecting people with God. Connecting people with God. I'd like today to take that just a step further and have you consider this. God wants us connecting with each other. Not just connecting people with God. That is ultimately what it all comes down to. But connecting people with each other. And I want to I ask you a question today that's going to frame our time together this morning. And I want you to allow this to be the underlying thought as we kind of take this journey together through this idea of connecting people with God and connecting people with each other. And here's the question. What would happen if I connected with God connected with others, and I lived my life for something bigger than myself. What would happen if I connected with God, I connected with others, and I lived my life for something bigger than myself? See, having a sense of community and purpose unites us. Being a part of a community can make us feel as though we're a part of something greater than, than ourselves. It gives us opportunities to connect with people, to reach for goals, and it gives us a sense of safety and security, and even more than that, it gives us a sense of purpose. That's why today I'm talking about community and serving in the same message. But I want to start with the community part, and I want to take you to, to a, a passage, if you will, in the New Testament, second half of the Bible, that I think captures this uh, in, in a great way. And this is what it says. So friends, we can now without hesitation walk right up to God, into the holy place. Jesus has cleared the way by the blood of his sacrifice. Acting as our priest before God, the curtain, or the fence, if you will, into God's presence is his body. So let's do it, full of belief. Confident that we're presentable inside and out. If I were to stop right there, all of that makes our mission at TVC possible. 
connecting people with God. Jesus broke down the fence so that you and I could connect with God. But he goes on. He says, let's keep a firm grip on the promises that keep us going. He always keeps his word. Let's see, I love this, how inventive we can be in encouraging love. Say encouraging love. And helping out. Say helping out. Not avoiding assembling together as some do. So in other words, wait a minute. I can encourage love and I can help, but there's still this thing about coming together. That's required, as some do, but spurring each other on, especially as we see the big day approaching. Now, before I unpack this a little bit, I want to go back to the fence. Now, let's picture our lives as a yard, okay? If a lot of us were honest, we would admit that we like a good fence. I like to show you the things that are neat, that are put together, where everything has its place, I'm not sure I always want to let you into the backyard of my life where the things may not be so put together, where I don't have the welcome mat out, where the grass isn't cut and and, and all of that. See, the, 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 the front yard is what we show people, but the backyard is different. That's the real us. And getting in there, by the way, is by invite only, Right? You could walk, be walking down the street and stumble onto somebody's front yard and nobody's going to think twice about that. But when somebody's walking through your backyard, you go, what's going on? Right? And, and in fact, I'm going to build a fence because I'm not sure I want you to see what's going on with the real me. And I don't want you to see the parts of my life that aren't so pristine. I don't want you to step in the dog piles of my life. <laughs> right? I'm not sure we can have a meal together. The backyard's private. But here's the big, here's the the thing about fences. God's just not a big fan of them. He came to kind of knock them down. And uh, listen, not that he has a problem with a fence in your literal yard at home. That's not what I'm saying. Please don't leave here today and go home and tear your fence down. (laughs) But as far as being in a relationship with him, And being in relationships with each other, God wants to tear down any fence that is not making that possible. So I I want to challenge you today, not only to connect with God, but to think about allowing others into your yard. Remember our mission? Connecting people with, with God? So what do we do with all the fences that we've built, myself included? And how do you learn to love each other? I love what this writer in the New Testament, this guy named Paul, I love what he said, and he made it really simple. Just don't avoid assembling together. Now, you might look at that and go, yeah, okay. But you know what we do when things aren't going well? You know what we do when we wish things could be different? You know what we do when we come to places in our life where we see shame? Or you know what we do when we think that nobody else could possibly be feeling or going through what we're going through? We isolate. We cut ourselves off. We, we, we sort of put this fence up, if you will. See, community means I don't build fences. It means we head below the surface. It means authenticity. It means sharing ourselves with others. It means a deeper relationship than we can have sitting in chairs, in rows, in a room like this. And let me just tell you, TBC is a big church, but you can hide here. You can come weak after week, after week, and sit in a row and not really be seen. That's why we place a big priority on moving you from a row to a circle. We want to move you from a row to a circle, a group of people that you can know and who can be known by you, who will share their lives with you. Anybody ever see the show Home Improvement? 
Remember this? This is Tim and his family lived next door to Wilson, the guy on the other side of the fence. Now, if you watched Home Improvement, the entire series, for the most part, we never saw his face. This is the way their relationship was the entire series. The Taylors lived next door to him for years, yet they never saw his face. Sometimes, believe it or not, you can be surrounded by people, but standing behind a fence. And by the way, the enemy of your soul, two of the greatest tools in his toolbox for destroying people's lives are isolation and drifting. If he can make you feel alone and isolated, he can have a field day in your mind. Or if he can push you to live life without purpose, he can have a field day there too. That's why, again, community and serving. I don't want you to feel isolated and I want you to discover the joy of giving yourself away for the benefit of other people. So I, I want to ask you a question today. Whose yard are you in? And who are you allowing into your yard? We have a tool here at TVC that makes crashing the fence a reality for so many people. And we call them tribes. They're groups of two or more people that get together, talk with each other, share life together. Sometimes we pray for each other. Sometimes we'll open to the Bible together and people are on all spectrums of knowing what the Bible is and some don't know it at all and we're, we're just learning. But you know what inevitably what happens when we start talking? We realize that we're not alone. We realize that somebody else has been through what we're going through. Or maybe they're about to go through it and we can walk with them. Or maybe it's just the simplicity of knowing that someone's there to listen and to care. And so if you haven't taken a next step and thought about connecting in a tribe, I want to encourage you to do that before this day is over. You can simply text next step to 77948. Text next step to 77948. And we'll let you know how to get connected in community. Maybe you just want to ask some questions. If you're watching online, you can type in the comments area. There's some folks there who would be ready to answer your questions. Or as you leave today, go out into the, into the uh, lobby. Every one of our campuses has a next step area. Ask some questions. Now, I want to take this a step further because it's the people that you will serve alongside of that will play into you discovering what God might want to do in you and through you. And here's a, a passage that just really sums this up. He, he, he says, let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping out. Let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping out. You know, history repeatedly shows that people want to be part of something that's bigger than themselves. Now, I'll make that really simple. Let me ask you a question this morning. How many of you sitting here in this room today or watching online would like your life to matter? Raise your hand. Those of you watching online, you can use the little raise hand emoji. See, God's wired you for your life to matter. He's designed you for your life to count. In fact, I just want to show you a few things that if you don't even realize it, he's given to every one of you. The first one is he's given you gifts and, and we call them spiritual gifts because unbeknownst to you, you may not even realize it, but when you use those things that you think are just simple, common, everyday things and, and God decides to show up in those moments, you have impact on somebody's life. Do you realize that sometimes when you enter the room, you bring the reality of who God is into the room? 
And someone might walk away with hope. God's given you a heart. He's given you things you're passionate about, things that get your engine going, things that you love to do. What are those things for you? I don't know. We might have some similarities, and I'm sure we have some differences, but God gave you your heart. He gave you the things that you're passionate about. He also gave you abilities. He gave some of, the, some of you the ability to do things that I don't have the ability to do. I, in fact, I've looked around our building, and I've seen craftsmanship, things hanging on the walls that I hear so-and-so made that, or so-and-so did that, or I've been to our campuses, and I've heard, you know, that campus was built by a lot of volunteers, and I think, wow. I struggle at times to find which way is up on the hammer. (laughs) But some of you are sitting there thinking, I'd be terrified to stand on that stage and have to talk for 30 minutes. But this is my ability and my, my passion. How about your personality? God gave you that for a reason. He wired you a specific way for a reason. And the other thing that God gave you are your experiences. Can I just say this to you? Someone today needs to hear this. Even the broken ones he gave you. And he'll use in somebody else's life because he doesn't waste an ounce of our brokenness. So the things, those experiences that God has allowed He'll use in somebody else's life. And by the way, if, if, you, if you haven't picked it up, all of these make up how God has shaped you. How he's wired you. How he's designed you. They were interviewing a Navy SEALs trainer. And during the interview, he mentioned that only 10% of Navy SEALs recruits make it through the initial training process. And he gave some insights as to the guys and the gals who made it through. He said, it's not the big muscle-bound guys. They look impressive, but they don't always have what it takes. It's not the tattooed tough guys. They might look a little scary, but they don't always have what it takes. It's not the college-educated stars. They look like leaders, but they don't always have what it takes. The ones who make it through don't necessarily look impressive, and there may be times during the training when they're shivering in fear, but at some point during the grueling, punishing training to become a Navy SEAL, when they're the most exhausted, when they're the most mentally spent, and when it does not look like they can go on, you want to know the ones who make it through? The ones who dig deep and find a way to help the person next to them or the person around them. Because they realize that it's bigger than just them. How many of you have seen the Avengers movies? The first thing I love about the Avengers is that it wasn't about one person. The Avengers were a team, an ensemble, a group of superheroes. And they couldn't meet the specific needs of Earth alone. They needed each other. That's God's plan for you and for me. In fact, the the, the scriptures say it like this. The Bible says, your shape and my shape were given for the common good. God has designed, wired, shaped you for the good of those around you. You were created to help others, to serve others, to benefit others. You weren't just created for yourself and for your own enjoyment. When Pearl Harbor was bombed, one of the Americans who volunteered to serve his country was Bob Feller. Bob was a 23-year-old pitcher for the Cleveland Indians, a phenomenon who had already pitched a no-hitter and won 107 games in the major leagues. Bob was reaching his peak years as an athlete, but he gave up those years to shoot down planes in the Pacific. When he returned to baseball after serving his country, Bob went on to throw three no-hitters, 12 one-hitters, and to win 266 games. But his years of military service, during which he could have won another 80 to 100 games, cost Bob much of the fame that he deserved. 
When baseball fans elected the all-century team in 1999, Bob and his 266 victories were ignored in favor of two other pitchers. Some suggest that Bob Feller may be the most underrated baseball player of all time. Feller was once asked if he regretted his wartime service. I love what he said. No. I've made many mistakes in my life. Choosing service over glory was not one of them. What a lesson for you and I in both humility and responsibility. Humility because it's not about us, but responsibility because God knew someone else would need what every single one of us, you and I included, could bring to the table. Remember Thor from the Avengers? He couldn't save the world on his own. He needed the rest of them. And it was the same for the rest of them. The truth of the matter is that God doesn't need any of us, but he chooses to use us and invites us to be used by him. But he does that by bringing us together, mobilizing us together, teaming us up together, using us together, calling you and me and every one of you watching online to the table together. Can I tell you, this church needs you. This community needs you, not because they need you, but because they need God. And God in his wisdom and in his plan has decided that he would shape each of us with the ability to impact the world around us. We have a TVC Kids program that needs people to model Jesus for our kids. We have a student ministry that needs people to model Jesus for our students. And we say, I, I'm not even so sure about this Jesus thing. I'm not even so sure about this God thing. That's okay. We've got places where you can simply say, here's who I am. Let me loose. I want to help. And if you're not careful, you might just find God working in you and through you. Can you imagine with a little for just a little bit with me right now. Can you imagine what our church would be like if every single person was flowing out of their unique shape for ministry? Can you imagine what would happen to our communities in Hastings and Middleville and Delton? Can you imagine what potentially could happen in Barry County? Just imagine for a moment And then let me take you back to the question that frames it all. What would happen if I connected with God, connected with others, and lived my life for something bigger than myself? It was a cold November night in Times Square, New York. Officer Lawrence DiPrimo was working a counterterrorism post when he encountered an old, barefoot, homeless man. The officer disappeared for a moment, and he returned with a new pair of socks and shoes, knelt down in front of the man, held his feet, put those socks on them, put the shoes on them and laced them up. That act of kindness would have gone unnoticed and almost forgotten had it not been for a tourist from Arizona. Her snapshot taken with her cell phone on November 14th and posted to the New York City Police Department's Facebook page late the next day made this officer an overnight internet sensation. Officer DePrimo, 25, joined the department in 2010 and lived with his parents on Long Island, New York at the time. He was shocked at the attention. The officer, normally assigned to the 6th precinct in the West Village, readily recalled the encounter. This is what he says. It was freezing outside, 
and I could see the blisters on the man's feet. I had two pairs of socks on and I was still cold. He found out through some conversation with the man that he was a size 12. As the man slowly walked down 7th Avenue on his heels, Officer DePrimo went into a Skechers shoe store at about 9.30 at night. We were just kind of shocked, said Jose Cano, 28 years old, the manager working the store that night. Most of us are New Yorkers. We just kind of passed that thing by because we see it every day, especially in this neighborhood. Mr. Cano volunteered to give the officer's employee discount to bring down the regular $100 price of the all-weather boots to a little more than $75, and the officer said, no, I don't want your employee discount. I want to pay full price for these boots. He goes on and he says, every day from that day on, I kept that receipt in the vest of my uniform pocket to remind myself that there's nothing better than living your life for something bigger than yourself. He says sometimes people have it worse and we often get, up, get caught up in ourselves and we forget that fact. The world is looking for people like you and me to choose selflessness over the world's way of selfishness. And God is looking for people like you and me to come to the table and to say, God, here I am. I'm not sure all that I have, but what little I may have, it's yours to use. And I want to invite you today to take a next step in this area. There's a lot of areas here at TBC that are touching the community, that are impacting people's lives. Some of them are behind the scenes. Some of them are out front and everything in between. But you can make a decision today to choose selflessness and allow, allow God to use the way you've been wired and shaped to impact somebody else. And if you're willing to do that, I, I just encourage you to text next step 77948 or go out into the auditorium and, and talk with somebody in the lobby at our next step area and say, I don't even know where to start. But I'd like to try. And I know, I know that some of you are thinking, you just don't know, Dan, where I've been. You just don't know you don't know my story. You don't know the things I've been through. You don't know the choices that I've made. There's just no way that God could possibly use me. I had an aha moment several years ago that has literally changed my life forever. I was getting ready to lead our church through communion. It's a time where we eat bread and drink a cup and those things are symbols of the body and the blood of Jesus that crash the fence for us to come to God. And as I was studying and I was getting ready, I discovered that every seat at the table at the Last Supper had significance, it had meaning. In Hebrew culture, Hebrew tradition. So here's Jesus, and it's, it's the night that he's going to go to the cross, and he gets his disciples together in one room to share a last meal with them, something that we've now been sort of doing for years since. And the seat at his right, tradition would teach us, was the seat of honor. 
of all the people that Jesus could choose to put at the seat of honor, do you know who he chose? Judas, the one who would betray him. I am here to tell you today if you hear nothing else, you have been invited to the table of God and he's inviting you to the seat of honor and he's not done with you yet.